Protectors of the Sunnah. Sunnah. Protectors of the Sunnah. Alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Welcome to another session of our series, What It Means to Believe in Allah, Aqida, Aqida. What is the correct belief system of uh, in regards to Allah? We spoke about the fitra. We broke it down in plain, simple terms, uh, uh, English terms. For English speaking people to understand what is meant by that hadith that we were all born in the fitra. Inshallah, hopefully you guys understand it. When Allah says we were born in the fitra, the fitra means it is human. We are instinctively created believing in the oneness of Allah. Just like all of Allah's creation does, the sun, the moon, the animals, the bugs, the trees, the birds, the flowers. It is instinctive within all of his creation to believe in him. They come there, they, they, they are, are programmed to believe it. For us, we are created. And when Allah put the heart, when Allah created the heart in us, when we were in our mother's womb, that heart automatically is, is, is inclined to believe in Allah and its oneness. That's why when we come into this world as an infant, we come in dependent upon Allah for survival uh, and Allah through our parents. And that's what the prophet meant when he said it's the parents that make the child either uh, Jewish or Christian or pagan. Because how your parents, what belief system they are upon, they will raise you upon their belief system. So even though we come in like a, as an infant and, you know, in submission to Allah, you know, believing in him, as we grow, our parents instill their values, their, their uh, thoughts, their ideologies into us. And we become what they are or what our environment is. Okay. Everybody understand that. So that's what it means to be born in within the fitra. It's human instinct to believe in Allah and his oneness. Okay. When the child is raised by the parents, it takes on whatever lifestyle the parents as a, introduced it to, developed it with, and all of that. If your parents are introduced you and raised you upon Surat al Mustaqim, Islam, then you grow up Muslim. Like many of you here in my Zoom room, there you've been to. You come from Muslim families, Muslim countries, like myself, like Mukhtar. We're Muslim. This is all we know. But if any one of us were to decide, oh, we don't like Islam, I want to just lead this way of lifestyle and adapt a new way of lifestyle. And we become a Christian. Then after we, that makes us an apostate. That means we left Islam. We left what, uh, what we were upon in the beginning. Okay. So we become apostates. But then when you apostate and then like, which happens a lot here in America, you know, and then people realize, oh, my God, I made a mistake. This is wrong. This is not the correct belief system. This is not the correct way. So I'm going to go back to what I was in the beginning. I'm going to go back to my original belief system, which is Islam. That makes you a revert. That's the meaning of the English word revert. Revert means to go back to your original state, to go back to what you were, your original character, your original foundations. That's a revert. So for those Muslims who apostate, who are raised Muslim and apostate, and then come back to Islam, they are what the English word revert means. Now, if your parents raised you upon a different ideology, like say you were grown up and raised as a Christian, 
Then later you decide that this is not right. So you adapt the Islamic belief. That's a convert. So we just, I broke it down to you. And that's what convert and rebirth means in English dictionaries. A convert is a person that takes on a new way of life. Adopt, a convert is a person that adopts a new ideology other than what he or she was raised upon. So please don't misuse these terms. That's ignorance. Now, I know we have the urban dictionary. You will see the word revert in the urban dictionary uh, and the hip hop dictionary to mean what you guys have made it. But, you know, you're not a revert. If you're converting to Islam, you are a convert. A revert is an apostate who goes back to Islam. And we don't have that many in my website. OK, so I don't want to hear you guys interchanging that. So we talked about how the, the Muslim is born upon the picture. That means we come into existence automatically. It's instinctive to believe in Allah and his oneness. But our environment, the people we're in contact with, shape us and mold us to be what we are. And then we answered the question, well, what if we leave a human being to himself? Even if left to yourself, you have the shayateen, the devils amongst mankind and the devils amongst the jinn who will impact you, influence you and cause you to deviate away from uh, the truth. That's why in Islam, the prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, encouraged us to stick to cling to uh, the other Muslims around us, surround ourselves with righteous believers. You brothers should attach yourselves to the masjid, you women should attach yourselves to your homes, which is better for you, but make sure that you're doing like you guys are doing here at my website, you're attached to this Zoom room where you're surrounded by strong believers. So we established all that. And that's the first principle. The first principle of belief in a law is to believe in him and his oneness. And so let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen for today's uh, discussion. And by the way, the quiz, I'm so impressed with how well everyone did in the quiz yesterday, okay? So this is um, session number 10. What I'm gonna do is speak today about how a lot of people, you know, they deny Allah's existence, how they deny that Allah is one as Brother Mukhtar was saying, until a great calamity befalls them. You know, this is another uh, uh, part of being human. We will deny Allah. We will deny his existence. We will deny his omnipotence until something bad happens to us. Then when something bad happens in our life, you're diagnosed with a disease or you lose a loved one or something, you lose your job. Now you want to turn to God and pray. That's what the Christians do. They wait till a calamity befalls them. But we're going to talk about that. And that is part of the human instinct, too. That, too, is part of the fitra, too, guys. So that's going to be today's discussion. And this will be session 10, you know, in our uh, playlist on YouTube. OK, so again, it is often the case that the veils covering the instinct, the instinct to believe in a law you know, and, and a person is prevented from believing in a law and seeing the truth until something bad happens. Then they realize that there is no one that can help them but a law. And these people, when experiencing a calamity, especially a life threatening one, they will then turn to God. And the law says this this shows how a law knows his creation better than we know ourselves. Allah tells us this in the Quran. He says, and the interpretation, the meaning, till when your ships and they sail with them with a good wind and they are happy and then a stormy wind comes and the waves come from, and attack them from all sides and they think that they're going to be encircled with the water, then they call upon Allah, making their belief in him pure and for him alone. They then call upon Allah saying, oh, Allah, help us, deliver us from this, and we promise we'll be grateful. So this is the case. Allah says that he knows that this is something that we would do. You know, he created us. He knows the nature of us. 
You know, and you hear many stories about how people, for example, on airplanes and when the, the wind starts, to, the turbulence starts to knock the plane around, people turn to their Lord and, 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 and start praying and, and making promises or doing even confessions. I remember um, one day when I was working uh, my cell phone, I got a, a call on my cell phone. Of course, I had to go hide and talk. And it was one of my co-workers who was a Muslim that I used to work with back then. And she had went on vacation. She was going to uh, Puerto Rico or something on some cruise. And I don't know what had happened, but she had called me trying to make confessions. I said, excuse me, what are you calling me for? Oh, Sister Layla, I just want to let you know, you know, if anything happened to me. And I want to let you know that I'm the one that set you up on the job. What? Excuse me. You set me up. Yeah, remember that day when the supervisor came in and, and she said that she heard blah, 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 that you was on here doing lectures or whatever. I'm the one that told her because I, I said, wait a minute. You, so now you're doing self-confessions because you think you're about to die out on the ocean because you stuck up between a hurricane. I think it was one of them hurricanes from off of Florida someplace. I don't know. I said, you think that the hurricane going to hit you. So now you want to confess to me that you want to try to set me up. But Allah fouled your plans. I said, sister, I already knew it was you. I said, who else knew I was taking a break at three o'clock in the morning uh, to teach a class? Nobody knew but you. So I already knew. So it, when bad things happen, when our lives are in danger, that's when we want to do confessions. And that's when we want to turn to Allah and, and try to make things right. That's the nature of us. Like Allah says, only when you in danger. When your life is threatened, now you recognize me. Now you admit that I'm one. And also, uh, back in the prophet's times, uh, for the kids here, for the, uh, our Sunnah followers' children, they're learning about the life of the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Last week, uh, when we were discussing um, uh, before the prophet was born, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how his grandfather, Hashem, you know, went to the Kaaba and prayed you know, and all this, you know, the Arabs, they believed in the existence of Allah. Because again, uh, they are they are the descendants of Ismail. But the Arabs chose to associate partners with him. Okay, that's why in that movie, the kids asked me, so, oh, Sister Layla, you know, I thought that he was a capper. I didn't think they believed, but he's in the Kaaba praying to Allah. And, and, and he's, yeah, they believed in his existence, but they refused to worship him alone. They worship others alongside with the law. They didn't devote themselves to him alone. And the Quran speaks about that. Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning. And if you, Muhammad, ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they will say Allah. And that's how the Quraysh were. You know, that's how Abu Mutalib um, Abdu, uh, and all of them were. If you were to ask them who created the Kaaba, they used to swear by the Lord of the Kaaba. They knew that Allah created the heavens and the earth. They knew that Allah created them when they met with King Negus and tried to get him to to turn the Muslims over uh, to them. You know, they said, you know, they tried to plead their case case to King Negus. You know, even he said, yeah, we know that y'all believe in Allah and there's different things, certain things about pagan tree that that we have to understand we we understand that y'all uh don't know that those statues y'all know the statues ain't gonna answer you so even the Quraysh they or uh, if you were to ask them who created a law I mean who created the heavens and the earth they would say a law they would say a law but they would take it further due to their arrogance and they would say who created a law and that's where that uh, surah, uh, the surah Iklas came down, as Dr. Asim said, you know, uh, they ask you to tell you about your Lord because, but they knew that a law was a law, but they chose to worship alongside him. And then they would get arrogant enough to say, well, who created him? If he's a law, who created him? You know, so and this is why we stay away from uh, questions like that. OK, also, Allah says in the interpretation, the meaning, tell them. Who whose does the earth belong? Who to whom does the earth belong to? 
If you know, they will say it belongs to Allah. He's talking about the Quraysh. If you were to ask them, if the prophet were to ask them, who does the earth belong to? And they would say, oh, it, it, it belongs to Allah. Then you say to them, well, will you not remember that it is Allah? Allah is the Lord of the seven heavens. He's the Lord of the throne. And they will say, yes, he is that. And then if you say to them, will you not then fear him and believe in him? You know, this is where the problem comes up. So the Quraysh even acknowledged, you know, that Allah is the creator of the universe and stuff, but they still chose uh, to uh, worship alongside him. Okay. And like I said, they used to refer to the Kaaba as, you know, the house of, of God and all of that stuff, you know? So oftentimes it takes something bad happening in our life uh, for us to acknowledge that yes, Allah is one and in turn, turn to him alone and not to other things. You know, our nature as human bears witness to the existence of a law. But unfortunately, it's our environmental influences along with shaitan that stand between this knowledge, you know, and that's the problem. And again, a lot of people ask me the question, like some of you new sisters did about the prophet's parents. Yes, they're kafir, they're in hell. The prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, my parents are where yours is. He told the man, they're in the hellfire. They're kafir. You know, they knew of Allah's existence. You know, they, if you were to ask them who created the, the earth and all that, they would have said Allah, but they chose to worship alongside him. So the message has been sent. Allah says he sent the messenger to every people. The message has been sent, you know, but man, man chose, choose to distort it yeah, uh, as they do. And because of this, this is why the Quran offers the people who deny uh, Allah's existence proof, which their uh, uh, common sense has no option but to affirm. For example, Allah says in the interpretation of meaning, were they created by nothing or did you create yourself? Or did you create the heavens and earth? They can't help but say, no, we didn't. Of course, Allah did. And again, Allah says you exist and you cannot deny this. See how Allah knows his creation. We exist and we cannot deny this. So it's common sense, you know, that the things which exist must have a cause for existence. A camel herder knows this. He will say camel dung indicates the presence of a candle, um, a camel, and footsteps indicate that someone walked here. So look up, look around you. The heavens with their stars and the earth with the mountains and the valleys, they must indicate the existence of something greater than me. So again, we can't, a lot, uh, this is what Sister uh, Jamila I mean, um, Sharmila was saying in her answer to the quiz yesterday, Allah doesn't have to go into details to prove his existence. Anyone with common sense has to, all you have to do is look around you. Look around at the things you see and you say this, I didn't create this. I can't create this or so something greater than me must exist. Okay. And that's why even the um, uh, Kateria people, the people who believe in scholastic uh, the Islamic theology, even they, they uh, say this and know this. Um, uh, even the Kafir scientists, you know, they believe in the law of cause and effect. This law states that a possible thing cannot happen by itself without something else causing it. And because it does not possess the power to exist by itself and it cannot by itself cause something else to exist for it cannot give to others that which it does not ha have itself possess. So even that thought of uh, uh, cause and effect that the Kafirs uh, scientists who deny Allah have come up with proofs that this is garbage, that Allah must exist. 
Okay, so this is why we don't debate with people about, you know, the existence of Allah. And I want to share with you what happened with one of the early scholars of Islam. One of the early scholars of Islam was approached by a man who used to believe in Allah, and then he called himself denying the existence of Allah. This is one of those men. This is after, like the prophet said, the people will come from Persia. You know, either you will follow them or they will replace you. And this is that when all this happened where uh, Islam spread throughout the Persian empire and alhamdulillah, the Persians became embraced Islam. But then some of the sects came, you know, not just the Shiite. By the way, the Shiite are a, a kickoff of, of the Mutalizai. They are a kickoff uh, and they are another branch of the Qadariya. OK, but yet not only did those type of beliefs emerge and not only the Ibn Sina movement where uh, they wanted to use science to try to rationalize Islam and rationalize the law. But these but, but there were also people that uh, took Islam seriously and believed in the law. Imam Bukhari came from out of there and all of that. OK, but. One uh, brother who was a righteous uh, uh, Muslim happened to co come to one of the early scholars and say, I got caught up. He got caught up debating. This is why we don't debate Islam. He got caught up debating with the unbelievers and they ended up causing him to question his belief system. So he started to deny uh, or become doubtful as to whether Allah does exist. So he went to one of the early scholars and said, guess what? I don't believe Allah truly exists. So listen to what this scholar said to him. He said, what would you say if I told you that I saw a ship with cargo filled with goods in the middle of the ocean and that ship was being plummeted by waves and wind, yet despite all that, it kept sailing smoothly. And it didn't have any sailors on board to steer it. That ship was by itself in this ocean with the waves beating it down, but it still sailed. He said, would you think this is reasonable to believe? And the man said, yes, this is, this is, um, uh, this is believable. The scholar said, then, if it is not uh, <clears throat> a rationally possible for a, a ship to sail smoothly, without a sailor or a crew, then how is it that you can question uh, uh, the existence without a creator or a keeper? And that's when the man got quiet and began to cry. And he said, oh, you're right. And he ended up repenting and coming back. He reverted back to Islam, subhanAllah. So again, you know, um, the surroundings, our environment, the people that influence us, the people that we are, we come upon the sh and the evil shayateen, they will do everything to try to steer us away from the correct belief system. And this is an ongoing battle that we're going to have to uh, endure until death. And even at death, your personal gen is going to be sitting there trying to get you to denounce your faith. So this is why we have to work on strengthening our iman. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, we're never safe. We're never safe from the evil influence of, of shaitan. We're never safe from the evil uh, influences of ourselves. You know, that's why he taught us to seek refuge with Allah, you know, to call upon Allah as often as we can, you know, and to try to, you know, do things to strengthen our iman, to continuously seek knowledge of Islam. Because the more knowledgeable we become of Allah, the closer we become to him and the more uh, under his protection, you know, that we become as well. Because like I said, a lot of uh, uh, famous people, you know, and knowledgeable people end up falling victim, you know, to these type of thoughts. Okay, Allah tells us in the Quran, in the interpretation of the meaning, were they created by nothing or were they created or did they themselves create themselves? This one verse of the Quran forces rational minds to accept that there is a creator who is to be worshiped, okay? Allah doesn't sit around talking much about his existence because he'll say beautiful statements like that that will cause us to uh, uh, accept that he is uh, in existence. 
We have a hadith where one of the companions said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was reciting the chapter Atur in the Maghrib prayer. And when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got to the verse where Allah says, were they created by nothing or were they themselves the creators or did they create the heavens and the earth? No, but they have no firm belief or are they, are with them the treasures of your Lord or are they the tyrants with the authority to do as they like? He said when he heard the prophet reciting this verse, his heart began to soar, you know, and this is why um, Dr. Asim is so uh, intent on teaching us the meaning of the Quran, that class that we have on Fridays. We're doing uh, the Surah to Ikhlas. If we as non-Arabic speaking people are truly understood the meaning of those words that we recite when we pray, we would be like this companion. You know, we would ponder the words of Allah. Our hearts will soar and we'll just feel such passion and so such love and closeness to him. And that's why it's so important, guys, for you to pay attention in these classes, because what he's teaching you, Dr. Asim, the true meaning of the Quran in your language so you can understand it. You know, it'll help to make you a stronger, better Muslim when you recite those words. You could be like these companions because they understood what Allah was saying. Okay. And I want you guys to also listen to how Prophet Abraham responded when a person came to him questioning uh, the existence of Allah. Allah tells us this story in the Quran. He says, have you not looked at him who wanted to argue with Abraham about his Lord? He wanted to argue with Abraham because Allah had given uh, Abraham the kingdom. Abraham said to him, my Lord, Allah is he who gives life and causes death. And when Abraham said that, the man said, well, I give life and I cause death too. How did Abraham respond to this? Well, Allah tells us how Abraham responded. And the way he responded, you know, proved that this man was a liar and an idiot. Abraham said, oh, really? He said, Okay, since you give life and you cause death, Allah brings the sun from the east. The sun rises every morning from the east. So now can you make it rise, rise from the west? The man was dumbfounded. Okay, the man was dumbfounded with that response. So the result of this was that the unbeliever was totally defeated by Abraham. And Allah guides not the people who are wrongdoers. And again, a lot of people need to understand when we say Allah makes Muslims, that doesn't mean, as we talked about when we first talked about uh, the Qadr of Allah, that doesn't mean that Allah jumps in your body and chooses for you to either believe in him or not. Okay, Allah says that he's not going to even make an attempt to guide you unless you first make the attempt to change yourself. This man that wanted to argue with Abraham, you know, he had no intentions of, of changing himself. He did not believe in Allah. He was a pure kafir. He didn't want to believe in Allah. He wanted to believe just like Pharaoh that he was Allah. So Allah left this man to himself. Allah did not touch his heart to guide him. Allah only touches the heart to guide those of us to him who are since who sincerely believe in him and who want to change. And all of most of you who are converts, you are examples of that. Many of you were upon other belief systems, you know, other ideologies, other ways of life. But when you were you were sincere in trying to seek the truth, you wanted to know the truth as Sister Cardi told us she wanted to know the truth. She wanted to know the true way to happiness, the true way to paradise, the true way to a better life. And that's when Allah touched her heart and guided her to it. So, but Allah is not going to do that unless the person is sincere and the person sincerely believes in him and wants to be guided. Okay. So um, again, 
uh, 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 this is how, why, again, more explanation and proof as to why Allah doesn't uh, sit around arguing and trying to prove his existence in the Quran to the unbelievers. And this is why we as Muslims don't waste our time with this type of nonsense either. We handled them the way Prophet Abraham did. We handled them the way that early scholar did. We handled them the way the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. Okay, you can give life and death because you could kill me and take my life. You can go get make a get married and have a baby to create life. Okay, okay, you can do that. Okay, you see how the sun just set in the in the west? Can you make it rise in the west? We just throw the realities back at them like that. That leaves them dumbfounded and stupid. That leaves them stupid. Okay, well, look at that. There's a boat. That boat is still standing up in that, in that river over there. Even though the winds is blowing it, it's still there. You know, we, we hit them back like that. We don't waste our time arguing and debating with them as to the existence of a law. Because first of all, it's in our nature. It's instinctual. We come in the world instinctually inclined to believe in and accept that he's one, you know, but if the heart's corrupted, the heart's sealed, the heart is stained through the shayateen and, and the shayateen's allies, Allah will leave them people to themselves. All right. So I'm going to stop right here for today. Uh, inshallah, tomorrow I'm going to give you a quiz to cover what I discussed today and yesterday. And then I'm going to go to the next principle of um, uh, belief in Allah. Subhana kalahuma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Are there any questions?